Hello and welcome back to another episode of KSP POV where we play Kerbal Space Program in first person. Today we've got a very special episode. We are now taking another trip to the Mun, another crewed landing mission, but this time with the Alcor pod. So this is the design that we came up with in the last episode. Um, we did have some troubles getting it to orbit, but by the end of the episode we decided to add on two extra side boosters uh, that you saw in the opening shots um so yeah so we have four boosters in total uh with fuel lines running between them asparagus staging so that way we can uh maximize our fuel usage so today our scientist's name is lagerbert and uh lagerbert has a little bit of a secret that she's been hiding and uh we'll find a little bit more about that later uh, for now, we're just going to take off. Um, I am actually going to leave most of the footage uh, un, you know, uncut. There's going to be some certain parts I'm going to speed up. But um, basically, since this is going to be our first true flight, our first victorious flight, um, spoilers, we actually do make it to the moon. Um, but uh, So I wanted you to see the whole process of the ascent, you know, what kind of screens I pay attention to, and how I have my screen set up so that I can get everything done. So we go ahead and jettison our first uh, set of side boosters and they uh, come crashing back to the surface uh, and hopefully those will net us some science. Not much. I think we've gotten almost all the science we can so far from that seismog seismographer All right, these side boosters are almost done but our uh, apoapsis is uh, steadily in increasing and our time to apoapsis which is uh, also important sometimes more important sometimes if uh, your time to apoapsis is not increasing that is uh, a bad sign that you might not have enough uh, thrust to uh, complete the burn so there's a lot of things that I'm looking at uh, on takeoff. There's a lot of information to be had here. And here's where I notice her secret. She is 100% badass. Our little logger bird. This whole time she's been hanging out with the rest of us, making jokes, doing science, and she never told us that she was a badass. So we feel pretty blessed to have her in our midst on this mission. So I go ahead and bring myself up to a safe apoapsis. Uh, it gives me enough room that I don't have to worry about skimming across the surface. And I do have to do a little bit of thrusting because uh, I'm still not high enough. Uh, oh, actually I am now. I'm at uh, 84. 84 kilometers. Yeah, so I'm in space. I still have much of my uh, lifting stage, which is going to be good, uh, except for the high G's that I'm about to endure. So we kick off those uh, side, the last of the side boosters, leaving our full lower tank uh, filled. We uh, steadily bring out our orbit. And there we go. We still have some fuel left. We're going to be using that to make our injection to the lunar sphere of influence. It's going to wind up being space trash, but. You know, we've made so much space trash in this series uh, so far. It's kind of it's kind of a lost cause trying to <laughs> minimize that as much as possible. Maybe in the next series we'll uh, have a ecological focus. That might be interesting. The next series will probably be um, a regular 
visual mode, EVA mode, third, you know, third person perspective of the craft. Um, I've really been enjoying this. Uh, it's been a lot of fun doing this. Um, and I still am going to, I still have a lot of plans for this series. I'm not saying that this is ending anytime soon, but, uh, if I were to do another Kerbal series, it'll probably be in EVA mode. I uh, will not be doing any Kerbal Space Program 2 videos. Um, I am very excited about it. Uh, it is a little bit out of my budget range, um, f especially for uh, an early access game. Um, but more, more than that is that I'm not going to be able to run it. Uh, Ironically, my computer more than surpasses all the recommended settings, all the best settings to have high graphic uh, or performance modes and all that stuff. Uh, outranks all the, the the specs. My graphics card doesn't even meet the basic specs on it, so uh, I will not be able to run it, even though my computer is decent. But it is. Uh, it just doesn't have a, a graphics card to handle it. it. Doesn't even have a graphics card to handle Parallax, so uh, I don't know. I wasn't really expecting much, but it is kind of odd to think that my computer was good enough in every other aspect. So it's irritating. Alright, so we're just getting ourselves lined up with the maneuver. And then we're going to just go ahead and bring ourselves out to uh, out to where it is. I do like the fact that you can time warp in um, first person in this, in the mission control room where we do our probes. Uh, time warping can be a little buggy, so we normally have to go into map view or EVA view um, to time warp, but I like that. You can do it straight from the craft here, and it's pretty much, I haven't had any bugs with it. So I'm doing a lot of this by eyeballing, just looking at the, those numbers. Um, I do have it plugged into the, the flight computer, so it handles the burn automatically, starts and stops it, which um, could be considered, you know, I, I wouldn't say cheating because it's, uh, you know, some people might consider that not the best thing, but here is how I uh, justify it. Oh, by the way, look at that gimbling. <laughs> look at how much gimbling is going on with that joystick over there. But here's how I justify it is that spaceships in real life have flight computers, um, and a lot of stuff is handled by programming. Um, uh, there is a lot of, there's many occasions where it's a pilot on a stick, but a lot of the stuff is handled by programming. And uh, we use the mod remote tech, which is what gives us the flight computer. Uh, but in order to use it, we have to set up a, an extensive network of satellites and communication dishes and all this stuff. So I feel like having done that, having spent the time to create the network, I believe that we've earned the right to uh, make use of it. So that was my thoughts. I was thinking about that, uh, you know, uh, as, uh, as I was watching this earlier, I'm like, well, you know, it's not exactly flying the pilot. You know, Dill Pond is not exactly being the ace pilot that he claims, uh, relying on computers. But sometimes uh, the computers are just more accurate, and it's, it's worth it to the mission to be more accurate. So the map is basically useless to us. We spend a lot of time trying to get all zoomed in and everything, but uh, don't end up making much use out of it. And there we are. We see the mun. It's a little blurrier than we uh, last last remembered it, but that's just because we're uh, speeding through time.
So then I realized that I didn't have my ladder on an action group, and there was no uh, there was no button or switch on the inside to have uh, access to the ladder. So I just wanted to just give myself the ability to to activate it when I needed without having to go out into EVA mode and then right click on the ladder and kind of just like break the immersion of landing. But since this is uh, again um, uh, an extensive mission in a brand new pod, I wanted to leave a lot of it unedited because uh, it, it's interesting flying this thing and I had a lot of fun with it. This uh, pod um, 4.5 stars out of 5. Um, it would just be a little bit better if it handled heat a little bit better and didn't freaking explode all the time. But uh, it just, you know, it forces you to be a little more creative. So we got creative with it. So we are going to rendezvous with the Busy B3, which is unpleasantly boarding on the dark side of the moon. Um, we are either going to be landing in the nighttime or near nighttime. Um, but there's not really much we can do because it looks like it's just now entering that and it's going to be a long trip before it gets around to the other side. Uh, and we're running with TAC life support, so every minute counts on a mission like this. We have plenty. Uh, we don't have a worry, but you know, if something happens and the crew gets stranded here, uh, we'll be feeling really bad if we decided to take an extra trip around the moon just so that way we can land in the light side and we ended up wasting food and oxygen that would have kept our Kerbals alive longer. Because we can't lose three Kerbals. You know, we've, we've already lost two Kerbals so far. Um, and you know, it doesn't look good for the agency, but it's also like those were seasoned veterans of, of the, the program. And uh, that experience, that knowledge, that skill, gone. All those years of training, gone. And uh, we don't have uh, any chance of recovering them. They will not be respawning. So just as uh, we tested, we had a little under half um, of our fuel left. So I was very happy to see that. That uh, we had roughly predicted correctly in our simulation. However, the thrust to weight ratio of the Boodle engine was, was pretty trash and I wasn't very comfortable with the flight computer handling the, um, the suicide burn, or at least the momentum killing burn. Uh, so I decided to not only kill the autopilot, but um, uh, bring up the next stage uh, sooner than expected and have all four engines of the landing stage fire alongside the Poodle engine to slow ourselves down. Um, and of course we do end up uh, following the same route so we had it but my fear was off was pretty much just a, a misjudgment of altitude. We had plenty. We had plenty of altitude. Um, I probably could have left the Poodle engine handling it, I probably could have left the flight computer handling it, but I was just not trusting either of that, and I decided to do what I did. But it is okay. Um, you know, we still, we're still looking very good on fuel. Uh, we're not planning on hopping this anywhere. Uh, it's just going to touch down, we're going to do some stuff, and then um, it's going to take off and come back home. Uh, those four boosters are meant to be the landing stage as well as the return stage and then we still have uh, an engine in the center to help us uh, deorbit and all that. So uh, I'm feeling pretty confident. I go ahead and uh, lower the landing gear. Actually I don't lower the landing gear, the landing gear automatically lowers so that's nice. And then here I drop it back down. I've been fast forwarding most of the footage but here I drop it back down because this is going to be our first landing in this can and I wanted to you to hear all the sounds it makes so we drop off our pool engine and it's uh, going below us and if you watch that screen you'll see it make contact with the surface there
coming up. And we can start to see the light uh, of our floodlights that are on top of our craft. Just being ever so gentle. Trying to keep it below 10 meters per second. We have some pretty beefy landing legs, but best to go as slow as possible. And we have contact. And we have a pretty stable contact, even though our slope angle is about six degrees, but overall it's relatively flat. So we are not going anywhere. We are not tipping. We are stable. So yeah, so I go ahead and press the action group and drop the ladder down. And I hop out Dill Pond. Gets to be uh, the first on the mun uh, again, actually. I think this is his second mun trip. So we go ahead and get him out and uh, take a nice little look at our craft. It's uh, so imposing, first person. In case you missed it, this is uh, the mod Through the Eyes of the Kerbal. It allows you to do this. First person IBA. So he's done his job. Time for our engineer Isaster Kerman to uh, come uh, outside and start setting up uh, little science outposts. Basically, a recreation of what we did on the planet Kerbin with the seismographers, uh, solar panels, and probe control section, all that good stuff. We go ahead and drop down communication dish and uh, some solar panels. Have a nice little shot of uh, the planet, so I wanted to take that before uh, getting back to work. And disaster is a, a one-star engineer, so those uh, solar panels should produce uh, a decent amount of energy. Um, those are from the Breaking Ground DLC, uh, and roughly the level of your Kerbal is important to how efficient all the machines are. So now that we have all the engineering done, we get our scientists out, or a little badass logger burn. She puts down the newly acquired Mystery Goo experiment and the seismographer in the control station. Then she decides to do a little bit of a EVA experiment. But Logger, no, don't face towards the ship. No, that that's a very bad idea. Logger Bird, please don't, please don't hit that. Logger Bird, no. That won't come back to bite us at all. So now that the base is done, it's time for her to head back on inside and cozy up for the night. Oh, then we're going to play some cards, have some snacks, wait for the sunrise. And now Loggerbird has uh, another task, our secondary goal, which is to bring a Munstone back with us. And so as, uh, as she learns how to <laughs> use the RCS thrusters. Uh, she uh, heads over towards the rover, which is uh, what we aimed our our uh, craft trajectory to be. And uh, sorry for not doing this uh, EVA flight in first person. I had uh, forgotten um, after doing the whole base building. And the base building I did in third person because I tried to... Oh, if you saw there, she spaghettified a little bit. But overall, it's okay. But um, the base building I tried to do in first person and was having some difficulties with. Um, I'll play around with it and see if I can find a better way of uh, doing it. So just for, for the time being, just for the sake of getting it done, especially since I was doing it in the dark, I did in third. And I should have done this flight in first as well, so I apologize about that. But what I can let you know is that we have another uh, chance to do EVA uh, spacewalking, and we do do it completely first person. And uh, it is a very harrowing journey because we uh, we mess up pretty badly in space. But that's uh, that's in a future episode. So here we are. We found uh, well, the busy bee found the the Munstone. But here we are uh, 
go ahead and taking our samples and collecting it to bring it back home. Uh, so Lagerbert waves goodbye into the busy bee after they trade the stories of life on the mud and then uh, she goes ahead and brings the science home, but not before uh, forgetting how her RCS pack works again. So she uh, she just goes ahead and lays there for a little bit, stares up at Kerbin and thinks about her life and all the things that led her to this point. She has a nice little thought and then uh, is ready to come back home. A little near miss front flip. And then it was right here where she knew she had messed up. And that was the tragic end of our 100% badass Lagerbert Kerman. She came rocketing down to the surface with too much force. Uh, and even those little RCS packs can uh, pack quite a punch. Dilpon Kerman knew she was gone. He took a deep breath, having lost another crewmate. He looks at all the science trash that we just left on the on the planet's surface and thought about how he's uh, going to be leaving the body of his his uh, co-worker behind. But uh, there's nothing left to, to collect, so he's just going to head home. So it's an easy takeoff. It's uh, the low gravity of the mun, so there's nothing really to worry about. Just uh, keeps focus, helps them not think about uh, the tragic loss they just faced. Because after all, they're still in space, and uh, there's very little keeping them from the same fate. They have enough fuel that they just go ahead and burn straight upwards. Uh, to escape the sphere of influence of the Mun. They don't bother getting in orbit. And there's enough food that they can come around to the, uh, the Apoapsis, uh, which is the best place to burn for their slowdown because that is the slowest point of the orbit. So they're already going. It's slow as they possibly can and just bring yourself to go a little slower to bring yourself in and we're using the last of our fuel to uh, burn just above the atmosphere go ahead and bring that back in so it's a nice low orbit uh, that way we don't have to tumble through the atmosphere over and over again to uh, aero break so we kick off those boosters that were meant to bring us home, and then we use uh, our last stage, which has way more fuel than we will ever need to bring ourselves back. Um, so we're not worried about that. We're going to end up, you know, just wasting it. But it's better to have it than not need it. Than need it not have it. So we go ahead and bring our periapsis down to about 42 kilometers. Uh, that is my magic number that I enjoy. Uh, because that way, if I'm at uh, if I'm at this kind of orbit where I'm just just above the atmosphere on our apoapsis, 42 kilometers is enough to bring us down in one shot, um, while still being at not too steep of an angle. So here I turn on all the air conditioning units. I don't know what those are, but I have a feeling that they control the heat in some aspect. So I flip them. Um, there's still some things in this pod that I don't understand, um, but uh, I've, I've been learning. So now we go ahead and uh, point ourselves retrograde. We uh, go ahead and get ourselves ready for our descent. I have learned that that NAN glitch sometimes can be fixed by just putting that on a different screen. So if I have this middle screen up here with the orbital information, that apoapsis and periapsis might show up. But overall, I don't really need it except to know what altitude I'm at currently. So the nav ball starts to spin because in our simulation, we added a spin, uh, a, a roll technique 
and that helped spread out the um, the heat, and so uh, so that was potentially what led to our safe arrival. So we are going to continue uh, that uh, maneuver as the spin the spin technique. So there's going to be some things to look at here on the screen. This is the view I'm going to be keeping for a while. Uh, the main thing to look at is in the top there's the temperature gauge. You'll see the little uh, bar on the right. The little green bar is going to jump up and when it turns red that's, uh, that's when we really need to start worrying. Uh, the screen in the middle is going to show the, the camera view of everything. Soon there will be some fireworks to look at and that'll be nice. Uh, out the window in the left hand corner you'll see uh, Kerbin eventually and then down in the lower left hand corner you'll see our nav ball spinning wildly yeah my mouse is hovering over the temperature gauge and that's the temperature of the pod and if that thing reaches the top uh, everybody aboard will die so it's a uh, very important to keep spinning and uh, so if you are prone to motion sickness, I would say focus solely on that temperature gauge. Uh, if you don't mind seeing a little bit of spinning, <laughs> well, there's going to be a lot of that. But hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, uh, we will make our way home if we can just survive the atmosphere. Um, the parachutes have already been tested. Uh, there should be no problem. Everything is deployed and the radiators are on. All we gotta do is make it. Spinning's gonna get pretty bad here soon. And this is about the time when I really started freaking out and wondering uh, if I should have done more rigorous testing. I keep pointing at the temperature gauge with my mouse, you'll see it hovering over there. And I f know it's not doing anything, but it made me feel like I was keeping it down. I'm like, no, you get back down there, you know, and you don't raise up. But, uh, so that's, that's half it's me trying to show you like, hey, look at this temperature gauge, it's rising. But then the other half is me trying to control it. But before I know it, uh, we are low enough into the atmosphere that we are no longer on fire. And a little bit before I should have, I stopped spinning um, and stopped paying attention to that temperature gauge. Uh, I was not exactly safe yet. Uh, luckily, everything's okay, but just you know, wasn't a good. I it's not good practice to stop that soon. So now it's just a matter of putting faith in our parachutes, making sure and hoping that we had set them correctly at the right altitude. And uh, hopefully we're not landing in the mountains. Yeah, you can see the Wii factor was uh, pretty good up until the moment that the uh, craft started blinking and uh, the temperature gauge turned red. That's when the panic set in. Wonder what uh, Lagerbert would have felt. Or what her panic meter would have been. But, just means that we have to uh, look at more applicants, some new hires. 
see who we can uh, get to fill her shoes. So it looks like we're actually coming down in the desert, so uh, we're going to be doing pretty well. We're not going to have to worry about tumbling, falling down uh, for ages. And then there we go, we got our triple parachute coming out, bringing us down to a very safe speed. Once again, I slow uh, the footage back to a more reasonable speed. You could hear the, uh, if I didn't talk over it, you could uh, you could hear the uh, altimeter countdown of uh, how close you are to reaching land. And uh, there we have it. Explore the mun. We did, however, fail to bring a munstone back with us, but uh, that's because we failed to bring Lagerbert back with us. As always, we get the troop together. Uh, this time they are at the South Pole in honor of uh, her science-faring nature. We plant a flag in her in her name. We write a plaque in her honor. And we remember Lagerberg Kerman. And that is where I'm going to leave this episode. Um, thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, please consider giving me a like. And I will see you in the next one. Take care.